Everybody, I want you to clap with me. You, do you remember me? Like I remember you. Somebody wants you. Somebody needs you. That somebody's me. That somebody's me. Somebody's. Has it ever happened to you? Forgetting on stage. It happened with me once. When I was in grade 10, and do note it, I was the most celebrated orator of my school. But I went on stage, and in front of the entire school, my teachers, my classmates, I blacked out. Absolute blank. Now, those who understand the emotion of embarrassment, they wouldn't call it an understatement if I say, at that time, I wanted to sink down the sands of time. Anyway, that was the first time I questioned the entire concept of learning. Why is it that despite our best preparation, sometimes we can't recall, we forget? We do all the preparation, but then we go all blank, answerless, clueless. Why does that happen? Okay, what is that barrier in the scope of our learning? Let's look at our phone lists, our WhatsApp groups, our friends list. How many prodigies do you know? How many inventors and discoverers do you chill out with? Reflect on your recent coffee rendezvous. And tell me, how many times did you end up talking about an idea that can change the world? How many times do you end up talking about something other than you? Your life, your problems, your needs? Chances are hardly any. When millions of students complete their school education every year, why is it that only a handful of them go on to become extraordinary? Why is it that only a pinch of them go on to have their names listed in the annals of history? Why are achievers so rare, so few, so sparse? As a society, we invest countless years of time in our education. We shower cats and dogs of money in our education. But is this education really helping us learn? Something that we can remember? Is it helping us learn that something we can recall? Is it really helping us reach our potential? Okay, let's be optimistic. Let's not talk about something that we can't recall. Let's talk about something that we do remember. We can recall. Now that's another shocker. All that we know, our so-called learning, is not ours. It doesn't belong to us. It's not in our possession. It's something that has been repeated so many times that it has got drilled into your head. Our learning is like a tenant, a rental asset. It's with you as long as you talk to it, feed it, entertain it. But the moment you do something else, poof, it disappears. Our learning is like an artifact in a museum. It's in the museum, but it doesn't belong there. You don't believe me? Okay, let's have a quiz. I'll ask you some questions, and I want you to tell me what you can recall. Are you ready? There we go. Washing powder, mm, washing powder. Mm, do the sea safety? Mm, say I. Well done. So. We have Nirma there. Okay, let's have another one. I'm sorry, Ted, I'm explicitly advertising. <laughs> okay, the second one. Mm -hmm, turmeric, mm -hmm, cosmetic, mm -hmm, turmeric, are you really green? Kiyu, muhasu, kujar, sepetai. Okay, we have. I think we have very bright audience. <laughs> well learned. Okay, let's have another one. Aya, naya, Okay. Now, now, definitely the last one. 
And this one, Asli Masale Sat Sat. Okay. Now, all this, uh, it's fun, undoubtedly, but all this so called learning, as I said, is not ours. It's something in your head. It's something that has been repeated and drummed into your heads. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? La 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 la, something, 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 I don't know. Reflect upon your years of kindergarten nursery rhymes. How many rhymes your parents spent years in making you memorize? How many do you remember? Maybe some bits and pieces, maybe, maybe some melodies here and there, but not the essence of those <coughs> rhymes, isn't it? Our learning is not our belonging. It's not something that is our possession. The same happens with the schools and colleges. Whatever we learn there, the concept, the terms, we wrote to learn it, we memorize it, we cram it, we mug it. It's like a fancy hat, beautiful accessory, but not an organ, not part of who you are. Years and years later, I became a parent of two children. And I think like any parent here, my dream is to have children who become great people. Now that's an, another interesting question. Who becomes great? Who are great people? Let's have another quiz. Now this time I want you to help me. A little tough, let's see. Thomas Edison became great because he invented? Electric bulb. Electric bulb. Elon Musk became great because he invented? Tesla. Tesla. Mark Zuckerberg became great because he invented? Facebook. Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg is done. Okay. Narendra Modi became great because he invented? Your own self. Okay. <laughs> Somebody asked a chai from my rehearsals. He invented chai. Somebody said India. The answer doesn't matter. But what matters here is all these great people, they got something on the table that wasn't there before. They did something that was out of the box. Authentic, novel, new, original. And there is a word for that in English language. It's called iconoclast. An iconoclast is somebody who challenges the norms and, and comes out with something original. An iconoclast is like a bouquet, a bouquet of three flowers. There is a flower bud called problem solver, a flower bud called critical thinker, a flower bud called communicator, an iconoclast solves the problem by critically analyzing it and communicating a precise, relevant solution. Do you want to see how an iconoclast brain functions? I can show you. Okay, I have something. Now I'll tell you the difference between the brain of a regular person and the brain of an iconoclast. Oh, what is this? Is it a bin bag or maybe a regular person's brain? Look at a clunky, chunky, cluttery mess. All that is inside, you don't need it. It's very noisy though. And if you want to find something valuable out of it, you need to put your hands in it, struggle, sift through. Chances are you might just not find anything. On the other hand, an iconoclast brain is something like a shopping bag, much more organized, streamlined, and if you put your hands in, you might just find something valuable, something you need, something that maybe is helpful. And this shopping bag reminds me of how the brain of an iconoclast functions. It's like a supermarket. We go to the supermarket, we see shelves neatly stacked with products, their aisles and corridors, well labeled. You need something, you know where to go. In the same way, an iconoclast's brain is like a shopping market, a supermarket. There are shelves and shelves of neatly stacked ideas, terms, concepts. He takes his part whenever there's a problem, goes to the corridor, he knows where it is, puts some relevant concepts and terms in the cart, goes to the till, beep. The transaction or the solution is done. That's how efficient an iconoclast brain is. So naturally, you would all agree, we want our children to become iconoclast. But how can that happen? Do we have to 
give them more extra classes in school, more stay backs. Maybe we have to bring back the teacher cut and up. No. We need to do something with the classroom lessons. Maybe change them a tad bit. Make those lessons like a pill. The moment you swallow it, it assimilates in your body. And the impact is right there from the first dosage itself. But then there is a big question. How can we do that? Friends, in the last two years, I did an experiment. I collected 40 concepts of MBA. Now, MBA is a degree that every child of any age, stage, regardless of gender, can do. In fact, that's a degree an adult does over a year. I took 40 concepts with a simple objective. Can those concepts be taught to school children in a way that not only they understand, but remember such that they can recall? And you know what I did? I converted each of the concepts into an animal story, much like the Panch Tantra or Champak. Now, when the story was introduced in the classroom, the students of grade three to grade eight, initially, the students were asked very simple WH questions. Who did it? What did he do? When did he do? Where did he do? The idea was to chronologically and sequentially put the story in the head. And please note, at this point, the MBA concept was peripheral. It was out. And post all the WH questions, a lot of whys and hows were added. Now that was the moment when the MBA concept was introduced. Why did the characters do that? How did the characters do that? And the discussion was in the light of the MBA concept. And guess what? Not only did the children find it more engaging, but also they understood it and when bit by bit, 40 such concepts was introduced over weeks, I did a little assessment. The students were given rare business situations and case studies to analyze. And you know what the children did? A lot of them could recall the concepts I had taught in the beginning of the lesson, somewhere in the middle. A lot of them could recall the concepts I had taught in the ending of this workshop. And a lot of them did actually intermixing of those concepts. And they created something absolutely new. Something which even I hadn't thought. Not taught, not thought. In other words, those children were analyzing real life situations like with their inventiveness, originality, in other words, like an iconoclast. Ladies and gentlemen, my dream is to convert every textbook into a storybook so that when children listen to that, not only do they understand, but they remember that as a learning that they can utilize to invent something. Thank you.